Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Really excited to have uh, San Sandra and Javi here from the uh, Adavinta team. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, they have a really great story around data mesh. They've, they've put out uh, a couple of great posts. I'll, I'll be putting that into the chat as well. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're really excited to have them tell us about what, what they've done, gone through their journey, uh, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. And, um, you know, if people want to chat during, great. But uh, if you have specific questions, feel free to um, throw them in the Q&A session and then we'll, we'll get to that at a uh, later point. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Sandra and Javi and, you know, I'll, I'll be silent here and, and rejoining for the, the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Scott. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, Happy to see the list of attendants, uh, some familiar uh, names, but also uh, people that is interested in, in our journey. So today we are going to speak about the data mesh journey at Adevinta. We are going to explain a bit um, what is Adevinta and who we are. And then we are going to drill into the data mesh uh, journey that we have been through during the last years. We've split the presentation into several um, um, phases. And um, we are going to go through all of the principles of the data mesh and how we have implemented them or uh, what, what is the status today. At the end, we are going to do a, a final recap on the uh, benefits uh, observed, okay? Um, okay, so what is Adevinta? Adevinta is the world uh, leading online classifieds group. So we are a, a group of marketplaces that we operate in, in 16, uh, countries. At the end, what, what we do is we provide technology for buyers and sellers to, fund, to facilitate uh, finding what they need. It could be a job offer, it could be a flat, an apartment, a car, or it could be uh, if you want to sell your sofa or, or whatever you have at home, um, you can also do that through, through our brands. So we have a portfolio of 40 digital products and, and websites. And uh, some numbers uh, behind the Devinta is that we, overall, we, we account for 3 billion monthly visits. We have um, 7,000 employees approximately around the globe. And as I said, we operate in 16 countries and we have uh, 40 products. Maybe you don't know what Devinta, but if you uh, live or have lived or uh, uh, happen to, to be in one of these uh, countries highlighted, uh, maybe you have used or you know uh, brands as uh, Le Vonquois in France, um, Gumtree in, in, in several uh, countries. In Spain, we are uh, famous because of uh, the Photocasta, Vitaclia, Infojobs, uh, Motos.net, Coches.net, and Mil Anuncios. And as you can see, we have a strong portfolio in, in Europe. And um, thanks to the, the recent acquisition of the eBay's classified group, and, and now we are in the process of merging with, with this other company. We have extended our portfolio also to uh, America and, and Australia and South Africa. So this is a bit of the introduction of, uh, about Adevinta. Of course, uh, as you can see, we have a lot of brands that uh, are marketplaces and they have a lot of similar, similar needs. So uh, this helps introduce uh, Sandra and myself and what we do and, and, and where we work, right? So Sandra and myself, Xavier, we work at the Global Capabilities Central Organization. So this organization provides different solutions for the different marketplaces to adopt, right? Um, there are uh, solutions that are more focused on data, but also we have some solutions that are, uh, for example, a common platform to, to uh, centralize and orchestrate your deployments. Specifically on, on our side, we focus on the analytics uh, part and, and experimentation or A-B testing. So I give it to, uh, no, I, I will continue and then I will give it to Sandra. I will give the word to Sandra for the, for the uh, principles of uh, the data mesh. So uh, what has been our journey and uh, what has been the, the reasons behind building uh, an ecosystem uh, of uh, analytics, okay? As I was mentioning, we work in the Global Capabilities Organization. We provide 
services to the different marketplaces that are part of the Adelinta uh, organization, and they can leverage uh, them, right? So what do we mean by uh, products, right? Data products. So for example, we have services to moderate the ads that people um, uh, submit to our platforms, right? To, and we, we detect uh, uh, fraud and scam and, and this type of uh, things through this uh, service that is global and every marketplace can integrate and use. We also have a recommender systems that uh, people can leverage and can and use in, in their marketplaces to provide recommended uh, items, um, whether it's a, a house or cars or consumer goods, right? They, they can uh, use the, our central recommender systems to to improve the recommendations in their um, marketplaces in their countries. We also offer image recognition algorithms and also uh, chat or messaging uh, services, right? So as you can see, all these central uh, products or capabilities, they generate a lot of data and, they, and we use this data to measure the impact that these products have on our end users, right? So for us, it has been crucial that we capture, we store, we clean, and we make this data available to people that make decisions uh, with this data. So data analysts, data scientists, and product managers. These profiles can be uh, profiles that are in, in the central organization, in the central capabilities, but it also is a product manager, uh, managers or analysts in uh, the local uh, marketplaces. So, I hope that the, the introduction was clear where, where we work and, and what we do. And uh, I have to say that we have been iterating uh, during the past years on, on our uh, data mesh uh, journey or, or our ecosystem for analytics uh, journey. And it reached, we reached a point, let's say maybe one year and a half, two years ago, that, that we found out that we got some things right, right? But there were some things that we're not working anymore, right? So let's detail uh, what, uh, what are those things. So on the left uh, side, what, what we got right, the first one is having a self-serve data infrastructure, right? So we have an awesome team uh, called uh, Data Highway in, in, in our, uh, they are our uh, brothers, right? Uh, in, in the organization. And um, they provide uh, an infrastructure that is self-served for us to being able to create data sets, uh, delete data sets, give access to people, um, implement, for example, uh, data takeout and data deletion uh, that are mandatory by, by the GDPR law in Europe, for example, and in other places, it's the same, right? So, so we have uh, a, a full-fledged team focusing on this data infrastructure that we as a creators of uh, data sets as products, right? We leverage. And this is something that is working well and, and it, we got right as, as, a, as a company and as an organization. The second point is the fact of treating data as a product. And uh, here I have to say that um, we, we have been uh, discussing a lot internally, no? and, and we have been um, uh, requesting or being very demanding uh, of ourselves when we publish a new data set or when we publish a new uh, table to, to make sure that it's well documented, that can be accessed by the people, that people know the different ways in, the, in which it has be, it can be accessed, that we have examples, etc. Right? We, more on this, we will speak about uh, later. But this is something that we got right uh, from, the, from the beginning also. Um, a bit of a compliment on the above is like uh, we offered uh, every data set via SQL and this has helped uh, um, gaining more traction and gaining more people to, to access this data, right? So uh, maybe in, in a previous iteration, uh, the data sets were only accessible by uh, a programming language like Python or uh, a Scala, but when we offered uh, data in, in SQL, um, product managers, data scientists, data, data analysts jumped into accessing this data via this, this uh, query language. And then finally is the, the, the ability to split the data by domains, right? So we have clear central products that, uh, that belong to a, to, to a specific domain, right? 
So um, yeah, this this has worked uh, uh, very well in when when trying to uh, uh, decouple or split the the, the centralized uh, approach that we were using to to building the the, the analytics ecosystem. Right. So I, I've spoiled a little bit the, the right part because actually what worked well until a point uh, has to be uh, it's about centralization, right? So we were used to build everything from a central perspective. And uh, when we uh, say everything, we, we consider the implementation, right? So the implementation was done by a, a central team. Um, the governance, right? Uh, the fact that we were a single team uh, uh, made it easy to, to have the governance in, in, the, in the team. Uh, but then it was challenging for the, for the domains and, and we will explain how we have solved this uh, later. And, and finally, we also had the centralized computation, right? So all the pipelines to generate the different uh, data sets were on the same cluster. And this, uh, we reached a point when it was not manageable uh, anymore, right? Uh, in terms of owner ownership and uh, yeah, issues that can happen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So some numbers to put in context what we are talking about, and then we will dig uh, deeper into uh, how we have overcome those challenges that I, I explained no? and how we are embracing the principles of the data mesh. As of today, we have seven domains, uh, including uh, cognition, messaging, recommendation, search, traffic content, and users. So these domains, so, well, one thing it, that is important is that we don't consider geographies as domains, right? So uh, for us, a domain is, is a, sp a specific area of influence uh, in our business, right? That uh, we can tackle and then um, uh, all the geographies, let's say, uh, have co or comply with the same standards when it comes to uh, recommendations, messaging, and, and the rest, right? Um, we have overall uh, around uh, or more than 50 pipelines nowadays that uh, generate around uh, 30 data sets or more. Um, more or less, we have some uh, or more than 15 uh, long-lived dashboards um, that uh, the data analysts implement thanks to the data sets that are being provided by the different domain teams. And Overall, we have 11 data engineers working behind uh, all these uh, seven domains. And uh, the dashboards and, uh, and the, the tables that we have are uh, used by more or less uh, 40 users uh, every week, right? Actually, this is not about the dashboards, it's more about the, the, the data sets are being used for uh, around uh, 40 weekly users. The dashboards, it's probably uh, more. So, so this guy has given us a perspective on, uh, on how big or small this, uh, this project, this mesh is, right? So now I'm going to uh, hand it over to Sandra and she will explain about the, the principles. Thank you for the introduction, Xavi and, and Scott. Um, yeah, we, we are going to focus on how we adopt the four data mesh principles uh, at Adevinta. So, uh, First principle is related to domain ownership. Data as a product. You can move to the next, Xavi, please. <laughs> data, data as a product. And the third is self-serve data platform. And the last is a federated computational governance. Okay. So let's let's start talking about domain ownership. And I wanted to not do the differentiation, no? What does it mean when, when the ownership is centralized? And what does it mean when the domain, uh, so the ownership is in the domain, no? So when it is centralized, um, the team, the central team needs to be on board to the domains, which is not, they need to know the information about the data in the domain. Also, no, they are exposed to multiple domain, uh, domain data, so they need to know about all the different domains. It, at the end, is a, finally, it's a bottleneck because uh, no, they need to focus into produce data, not no, uh, going deeper into the, the knowledge of the domain. And then next step is a battle of priority. So the priority is not, so the priority is now the domain, not the, the, the needs of the domain itself, no, the data itself. And then, 
it also means that the tooling that needs to be used to, to develop all these data products, uh, the development becomes very, very slow. And then when the domain, uh, when, when the ownership is in the domain, uh, they already have the, the domain knowledge. The priorities are already the priorities within the domain, so they don't need to battle. They need to battle, but just internally. And then the central tooling, the development, uh, start being faster, and also the time to, to get the data no? for them is uh, reduced. No? So this time to data, it's um, reduced for them. So this is is a regarding the no the, the difference when when domains are centralized or or are they are the owners and now I, I want to talk about the transition no because uh, this doesn't happen for a day to another so it, it, there needs to be a, a transition and we were through this uh, journey so the stage one no it everything starts with this central team bottleneck and then. At this moment is when the, the domain say, so when, when we decide, okay, there's it is needed to have a data engineer in the domain. So they need to staff a, a data engineer, one or more. It depends on the volume of the, of the data of each domain. Then it is needed to onboard these, these engineers. When it, it's coming from central, from central ownership, no? all the, 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 the tooling, it's complex and it's a monolith. So, the onboarding, the, the onboarding is complex. So we are talking about another data engineer, no? This is something that later we'll see that we want also to change, no? And so tooling is complex and, and it's a monolith. Uh, the ownership at this moment is still in central team, but um, we saw that the analysts in the domains, they were the best at this moment, no, they were the best to own a domain. In the meantime, we are transition. So we started to onboard them on what does it mean no, to, to, to own a data product. And then at this moment, no, with all these pieces are, are, are in place, the, the domain data engineer start to develop uh, data products no, in, in the domain. So this is related to the first stage. Then uh, we go to the second stage, no? So now uh, we have identified a, a, a profile that can own the domain, and then we have a data engineer. They start producing uh, data sets, data products, and this ownership is transferred to this analyst. And then there is some support still needed because no, they, they, they are in this uh, process. Once they have the ownership, Another thing that happens is that they start being more autonomous on building data products, no? because they don't need all the support uh, they needed before, but we still have a monolith. So the, the, the team, no? the central team, start to no? step by step splitting the monolith and start um, providing no? new, new tooling and new features for the domains to start building their products. But it is still a progress, no? The, 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 it's getting velocity, but it's still there. And then the, the how we see, no? The future stage and, and where, where, where we are more or less now, it's um, there is a dedicated data product owner. So it's not the analyst. The analyst is analyzing, consuming, no? Having fun with data. But then there is a data product. Uh, the, a, a product owner which is dedicated only to the data and then when it comes into building the data product it is a software engineer so it's not a data engineer it's a software engineer who is able to build data products i hope in a declarative way so so it means that you no know, we are able to provide better tooling and processes for it to happen and then there's more velocity creating the data products, and then you no, know, it's happy data consumers uh, using no uh, using this data. So, uh, as a as a as a, um, if, if you can change, tell me. as a summary, you no know, of this. Uh, of where do we come from, and what's the the current status, you no? Know? So. We come from a single team owning all the data sets and pipelines and tooling, no? so owning everything. And 
the current status is uh, the, the analytic solution teams now, it's owning some domains that are maybe used by multiple domains. So it's traffic, content search, users. And then um, this team is also working. So the team is also working on enabling no, backfield tooling libraries related to uh, business transformations, uh, analytics uh, functions. And then there are uh, other domain teams that they already own their own data sets and they already produce and maintain all this data. Yeah, and Thanks, Sandra. Yeah, Xavi, yeah. uh, we talk about data as a product. Okay, let's, let's talk about data as a product, uh, the second uh, principle. Um, to start with, we want to detail a bit what are the, the, the traits of data sets that uh, people hate to work with, right? So we've always encountered you know, cases where um, data sets or tables or uh, reports or whatever um, data product is not documented or is hard to find, right? Um, we have nested structures and variables that make it difficult to query. Uh, sometimes the observations that we have are duplicate and, and nobody has cleaned that or we don't know uh, why we have duplicates, right? Um, there is inconsistent information in the values of the different cells or different attributes. Uh, there, is, there is no access via SQL, which make it, uh, makes it harder for uh, people that is not familiar with this language. Um, and there is no examples on how to use them uh, or, or how to access it, right? So we, we found out that uh, uh, yeah, people doesn't like to work with this type of uh, data sets, right? Because this, what this causes is that there is a lot of time spent on, on quality assurance, right? Um, there is no interoperability, right? So we lack interoperability, interoperability between data sets because um, there is uh, inconsistent uh, naming. Uh, probably people creating data sets are reinventing the wheel because they are not reusing what is already available because it's not documented. Um, and, and this makes that, uh, well, what happens is that we have one-time approaches that are hard to, to reuse, right? Um, collaboration is difficult. Uh, there is more time and effort to spend uh, overall, right? Um, yeah, and, and no non reproducibility in, in analysis or machine learning models, right? On the other side, uh, we have the, the traits of data sets that customers love to work with, right? And this is when really you are treating data sets uh, as a product. Those are the, the principles that has, uh, or the qualities that have been addressed by uh, Zamak in, in her article, right? So discoverability, addressability, trustworthiness, fact that of the being self-describing, interoperable and secure, right? So we are going to detail how we have uh, implemented uh, those, okay? First of all, if we move into the disco discoverability, um, we have, as part of the data infrastructure, we have a data set catalog where you can uh, browse and, and look for uh, the different data that, that we have uh, in the organization, in the company, okay? So uh, this, uh, this, let's call it data catalog is actionable, meaning that you can request access in this in these data sets. You can, um, uh, for example, uh, grant access to other people. Um, you, you can see dashboards around the, the quality of them, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, it's not uh, only a, a reading catalog, but also you can perform actions uh, on this. And this is, has been custom built by the, the, the data infrastructure uh, team that, that we mentioned before. Um, so once the data sets are discover, dis, discovered, uh, they, they need to be addressable, right? So um, for each one of the data sets or in each documentation of the data sets, what we do is uh, we name the, the, the data set where to request access. And also we provide, which is the, the in our case, because we use the AWS cloud, which is the Athena table uh, corresponding to the data set and the uh, S3 path corresponding to that uh, data set in case you can you want to access this uh, programmatically, right? Um, so 
yeah, at the end, this is uh, very convenient by the for the analysts because in, in one single page, they can request access to this data set and they can start querying it uh, because they know the name of the table, etc. In the past, this used to be a word of mouth, right? So, so now we, we uh, get uh, much, much, much less requests uh, uh, when for uh, to access data. Uh, well, we, we don't get because it's, it's self-served at the end. Trustworthy, so quality is super important, right? And, and people need to trust the data that they are seeing and they need to trust uh, the, the, the data sets that they are uh, using, right? So it's not the only initiative, but one of the initiatives that we have uh, done is to provide um, quality levels into uh, Tableau dashboards uh, about if the quality of in, in that chart is uh, reliable or not, right? So this is something that depending on the time span, you can uh, provide, for example, uh, the level of unreliability, unre right? And you can say why. Um, and uh, yeah, this has been very useful because uh, when people look at the dashboard uh, and see this, they know that they can trust this data, right? So uh, in the past, maybe if they if this wasn't here, they uh, ju jumped uh, and, and they didn't trust because something was odd, right? They they went back to the raw data and they were performing the calculations uh, themselves, with, which is a waste of uh, everyone's time at the end. Um, when we discuss about uh, self-describing, right? So uh, the, the documentation that the data set uh, has needs to include what we commented before, right? The, the location, the, the mappings and the provenance of the data, uh, depending on where it does uh, come from, no? We need to understand how the calculations or the mappings have been uh, uh, performed. We need to have examples. We need to have how often this refresh and, and when. Uh, if there are any preconditions, and one of the things that are uh, most uh, valuable is the examples, right? So when, when building a data set, it's important to have uh, examples of SQL queries or notebooks that use this data set, um, because this also will reduce the, the amount of interruptions and requests that you receive from the, the analysts. Then if we switch to the interoperability, right? So we want to uh, have a common uh, naming, so nomenclature, because we want to enable joining between data sets from different domains, right? So uh, we will discuss more about the governance around this, right? But uh, in, in the uh, later principles, but uh, for, for us, uh, naming things uh, the same, right? Uh, if they are the same, it's super important uh, because it's also uh, preventing, um, uh, yeah, lack of interoperability and, and uh, waste of time for the analysts if, if things are not named the same. Um, for the events, we use the schema.org, although it's uh, quite uh, customized uh, at the moment, right? But it was a good starting point uh, for us. And finally, around security, uh, we, we can, uh, so we have a, um, tools that allows us to uh, request for access uh, to, to a data the set uh, by a, a, a provider and, and with an ex expired date, right? So uh, this is um, thanks to, well, the, the, the privacy regulations that we have in, in Europe, we, we make sure that the data that uh, we provide is only used for the time and for the purpose, for the rationale, that is necessary for the job at hand, right? So uh analysts when requesting data they can uh, set up this and and then it's easy for us to show how we comply with the, the regulations and and we we keep our uh, users data uh, safe so uh, sandra if you want to take the self-served data platform yeah i take this one so this is the the third principle no the regarding self-served um, data platform so if we move to the next. So in Adevinta, we have uh, different platforms where we are leveraging um, the infrastructure we are providing. So for example, uh, we have, no, uh, in, for distributed file system, we have uh, S3, Amazon S3, and then for access control management, we are using AAM. And for orchestration, running products, no, the internal code, uh, we have EKS. And then 
for distributed query systems, we have Jupyter or, or Amazon Athena. No? This is all provided by, by our internal platforms regarding no, the infrastructure um, that, that it's uh, provisioned for, for this case. And then when it comes into, for the developer experience, no, for the product developer experience, we also have here, no, we use uh, the internal platform of, of related, no, the, our data hub. And then we also no, are providing for, from the analytic solution teams, we are also providing more functionality that helps developer to, to develop, to, to create these data products. No? So for example, there are some sharing capabilities, no, like filtering map, dispatching and routing quality. And then we have some custom analytics libraries, business transformation libraries, dependency management, backfill tooling that is you know, available for the developer to do this, to create these data products. And then finally, when it comes into the supervision plane, um, we, we have you know, also in the platform, we have a data catalog, but it is important. So this actionable means that you can interact you know, with, the, with the data product. So this catalog, you, know, you can uh, do the data set management, uh, creating, registering, deleting, updating, no, adding more details, uh, setting all the privacy regulations uh, in this in this single no in this single page in the in the catalog, and then it also works as a knowledge repository, and then we, there are also some features regarding uh, validation no for the quality of the events, and yeah, and then for the for the last um, principle, which is uh, related to federated and computational governance, we we split it into three pillars: no, In the main principles, working agreements, and naming convention. No, so this this part is super important. One for all the domains to work together and ensure that they are producing data products as products no? as, as they are expected to be. So uh, if, if we talk about main principles, so th this they try to provide clarity on what should be fulfilled, who owns what, who needs to maintain. Uh, so for example, no, the, the first two are talking about who is owning a data element depending if it is a data element that it is in a domain, no? if it is in the domain, they need to create it, maintain, uh, they have no, the responsibility of the quality of this data product and, and they own it. No? But then when there's uh, these data elements are for more than one domain, it is govern, create, maintain. So everything is uh, on, no? on, on the analytics uh, solution team. Uh, to, to preserve no, this interoperability between the, the different do domains. Then for data quality, we always uh, request uh, that it needs to be fixed at source. So not, not changes no, in, the, in the pipeline to, to, to solve quality. So th this is something that we don't accept. So it needs to be solved at source or the closer possible to, to the source. And then the data set needs to be you know, stable to, to enable building analytics products on top, needs to be accessible by SQL, and data needs to be GDPR compliant. So this principle is not something that we just uh, wrote here. So it is there uh, documented that, and when we you know, uh, interact with the main teams, it's something that it is there because we need to have this all this clarity uh, provide. Then for the working agreements, so the second the second pillar um, here is the same. No, it's okay uh, if 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 you are you not know, owning the data set or or if if the analytics solution central team is owning the data set, you need to define. No, we need to work together to define. No, the nomenclature paths, documentation formats, and definitions. So who is doing what, um, processes, helping domain teams, uh, like you know, trying to do with them. Sometimes they, they, they know the domain, but they, they don't know maybe how to make the, the best 
decision, no, designing the the final output. So then here it's some interaction, no, uh, helping them to discover how to better represent this data when it is built, and then they use no, we share tooling to orchestrate, build, backfill, and and the tool can be used as well, no, for the domain team, so they don't need to to reinvent the wheel. Uh, if if this this one is important, no, because if, if in all this process we detect, no, that there is data or, or some elements that are duplicated across different domains, uh, this is this goes out and and goes to 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 across domain data set to avoid no duplicating or uh, this increase no the, the probability to have a quality issue no if, if you are doing exactly the same in all the domains so if this data is used for for use for multiple domains then it is a uh, um, cross no it's it's uh, developed by the analytics uh, central team then these uh, pipelines to build domain data sets run in the specific domain team uh, cluster. So they own also the cluster where the data is processed. And uh, a core data element can be only deprecated at the end of the following quarter. So we cannot just stop generating data. So we need to do a process saying, okay, we're we'll going to deprecate this data. And then you know, with this, we ensure that consumers have the time to adapt in case there's someone still using this data so they can adapt and change to the new to the new data product and finally uh, when it comes in uh, in conventions um, there are some convention conventions so for the type of the data sets we classify the data sets if they are low level aggregations, no aggregations or aggregations metric or metric tables. So all the domains, they need to do the same classification because it helps the consumers to understand the data before they see the data, no? So because they, they know the granularity of the data. There are some privacy levels that need to be set up. Um, the paths and the partitions, data sets needs to be flattened to, to help on, on the con, to help the consumers. Names are snake case and and no and, and, and for joining capability, you no know, two fields in different data sets uh, that contain the same information, they need to be uh, named equal. And now I Change it to Xavi. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sandra. So, so we have gone through the, the four principles and how we have uh, implemented them and how we understand uh, them or, or how we came into the same uh, conclusions, right? That uh, this was important. Um, to summarize and to close the, the presentation and, and before jumping to the Q&A, uh, let's talk about the, the benefits uh, that we are observing after uh, all this uh, all this effort right? so uh, the current setup um, has some strengths and and we are going to show some uh, sentences that uh, people on the other side people using the data sets people uh, on the analyst side have uh, mentioned uh, about the the data sets uh, that that are being generated behind the, well in this analytic uh, ecosystem right just for you to understand uh, the uh, BIC uh, name, it corresponds to the, it's the internal name for the analytics uh, solution uh, team, right? So uh, we also, we like very much you know, that this, uh, the, the data sets are the analysts uh, paradise, right? So it's where they want to spend time and and uh, be there and, and they find it super easy and, and um, uh, yeah. Uh, rewarding to to use because it, it fulfills their needs right um, it's good the the standardization uh, part and and the documentation the, the related information the glorious glossary of metrics um, where we where the things come from um, yeah so so at the end of the day is is super rewarding to uh, hear comments like this when we, you have worked hard to, to build a, an ecosystem of data sets as the one that we have been uh, explaining, right? So this is, a, um, well, uh, 
yeah, uh, rewarding. I was, uh, as I was mentioning before, to, to hear uh, messages uh, like this and encourage to, to continue working. Um, on the benefits themselves, uh, we commented during the presentation, but we had a lot of uh, human requests or uh, Slack-based requests regarding access to data. We have completely uh, removed uh, that uh, thanks to the documentation, the links to the data catalog and the features that the, our self-serve uh, data platform uh, provides. Um, there is a single point of entry on, on the most important data sets, right? So we have put together training material, uh, the documentation of the, the, the main data sets that you will be using on your day-to-day -day is uh, highlighted um, in, in our documentation repository. So, so people, when um, getting onboarding, onboarded into the domain or into the, the company in general, uh, they go through this and uh, this helps uh, when they have to do an analysis on their own. Uh, it helps uh, because they know where the data is and they, they know where to look at. One important thing about the, the domain, uh, the people in the domain, um, in the past, when we had a centralized implementation, it was difficult to gain trust, right? Uh, but now, because they are the, the, the product owners of, of the domain-specific data sets, they, they actually uh, trust their data because they have uh, helped building the, the data sets and they have all the, all the power to, uh, to build uh, uh, these data sets with the highest quality uh, possible. Um, because of that also, they are more prone to fix quality issues at the source, right? So if you are an, an, a team that is requesting another team to fix a quality issue, it might be uh, harder than if uh, you tell your own team to fix this quality issue, right? Uh, so having the ownership on the domains also makes that the quality issues are uh, fixed uh, sooner. And then at the end, we, we, we like to measure the return on investment of the analytics initiatives. So we have been able to uh, see an increase on uh, weekly querying users, thanks to uh, having all these training materials, documentation, uh, access via SQL, et cetera. So uh, we, we, we have more usage on these data sets. Um, the, our customers, the data analysts, are more efficient because they have time to uh, to do more of the analytics work and they don't spend time, they don't need to spend time um, checking the quality of the data sets or uh, uh, doing parallel not, or doing notebooks in parallel to, to try to find uh, the lineage of the data, etc. right? So they can focus on uh, product discovery, setting up a hypothesis, running A-B tests, um, so that's, that's where we want them to, to focus, not in, in cleaning data and uh, checking the quality of, of uh, the, the, the data that we uh, ingest. And yeah, at the end, uh, more product discovery, more uh, A-B tests. We have seen increases in the number of A-B tests thanks to uh, freeing up time of the, the analysts. So with this, we, we finish our presentation. Thanks for uh, listening. Um, now we can move to the q and I, I see that there is uh, already one, uh, one question. If you want to post more, uh, we, we have time for, for more questions. And uh, back to you, uh, Scott. Yeah, uh, awesome. Thank you so much for, for all of that. Um, so I think, yeah, the, this uh, great question by, by Tarso about how are the software engineers reacting to being responsible for the data pipeline themselves? You know, it was, did they see it as very different to um, what kind of work that they were used to do? And, and kind of, I guess, with that, I, I, would, I would ask if you've got more opinions on kind of the broader scope of how do you bring the software engineering team in and how do they think about that, you know, how do you get them bought in to this concept? You, you talked about kind of the benefits as to what, what you saw and why they were bought in once it got rolling, but how did you get it rolling? How did you get that started where they were like, okay, I see this? I think I can take this. Um, 
we haven't arrived yet to the software engineer building data products. No, we are we are in the data engineer. We did some tests. No, we, th there was a case with a software engineer that was building data by using our tooling, but uh, it doesn't work very well. So we still need to improve. No, so at, at this moment we we discovered no that there's a lot of things to be improved to make the the um, you know, all the capabilities that we are providing to build the, the data product to make to make it more easy you no know? so so that a software engineer can build it before without thinking that they are doing uh, data engineering you no know? and we we are not there yet uh, we we still have you no know, data engineers in domain teams but uh, it's becoming easier and easier which is uh, with each step the thing is if you have a data engineer in a domain team no what we want also to avoid is get frustration no for this data engineer because it's alone in this uh, in this team no and going for a software engineer it means that there will be more software engineers so they can no spread the knowledge and share the the work by creating data products or evolving their own their own products, and so we there's no reaction yet for a software engineer okay. uh, being in this in this uh, in this uh, situation yet. Okay, yeah, okay, that, that's that's uh, great, and yeah, the whole concept of the self serve platform is you know, how, how much self-serve can you make it? And she, you know, like there's only, uh, there's always certain restrictions to that. Um, another question that I had, you, you talked about the pain points that you saw around the centralization. Um, what would you recommend for others or, or what were the, the things where it became a too much pain uh, versus pain that you could bear, you know, what, what are the things to look for as to when that, that decentralization um, might make more sense? Because, you know, change is always painful. So what, what do you think others might look for around, okay, this centralization is um, becoming too much of a bottleneck versus it's a pain point. Everybody's got, you know, decentralized has pain points and centralized has pain points. I, yeah, I can answer that. I think that there are two factors uh, that plays. Uh, one is um, the, the bottleneck itself, right? So the domain teams that were requesting features, they were not getting them um, because of lack of capacity. So there is a lack of capacity to support the different domains. And in our case, they were represented by different teams. So it was very clear uh, who was getting the, the attention and who wasn't, right? Um, so, so I would say this is one of the things to, to look out. So you, you cannot serve uh, everyone uh, in a time frame that is reasonable, right? So when, when you tell a domain team that they need to wait two quarters for their data set, then, okay, maybe that's not uh, um, feasible anymore, right? So that's one thing. And I think that the the other on the other side for the central team in, in that case, um, I think that um, having to maintain a lot of pipelines, it's a, a team of let's say five to seven people can do it until a point, right? So there is a certain point where uh, a past past a number of pipelines uh, you cannot uh, cope with all the cognitive load that is being thrown at you uh, every day, right? So you have pipelines 24 seven running that if something breaks, you need to uh, fix that pipeline. You need to remember who has, uh, or you need to remember how, how it works, um, how to fix it, who has fixed it before, uh, get help and stuff like that, right? So um, I think that's another thing to look, uh, look out uh, when, when the team is cognitively overloaded by the, the number of pipelines that uh, they need to maintain and, and the support uh, that they can uh, give, then it's not uh, a good sign either. Uh, sometimes in 
traditional BI, uh, business intelligence teams or projects, uh, there is this saying, right, that the, once you have some pipelines, uh, some tables up and running, you spend 80% of your time doing maintenance and only 20% of your time uh, building new things, right? So, um, yeah, when, when this happens to your team, it's it's the moment to, to a split uh to a split into different uh, domains and, and to split the ownership if you have done everything else uh, correctly, right? And you have the right uh, uh, CICD and processes to deploy and to, to, to make sure that uh, everything can go well when you release into production. Yeah. Um, and, and there were two questions that are kind of in the same vein here that, that popped up um, around the pain points around when a data product lies under two different domains. And then, um, you know, as well, like, how do you decide when there are those cross domain elements of what ends up being centrally managed versus not? And like, you know, does that create issues as well? Because, you know, you don't want to have um, too many things, you don't want to limit the cross domain uh, sharing because that's you know a main point of, of data mesh is that the, the ability to to share that data across domains is kind of one of the big points of it but if you're going to have that you you know centrally managed then do all of your data products become that or how do you how do you manage kind of that push and pull between those yeah uh, i would like to specify this thing with the core no domains because it's it, yeah, we, we're talking about cross domains. This concept is uh, it, it, um, it's a bit complex, no? Let's say because it, it's kind of a domain itself, no? When we talk about this core, because it's the minimum that everybody, no? All the domains are using, no? Imagine if you are talking about visits or, or no? Or metrics that, that we are measuring in a marketplace, no? In, in, one, of our, in one of our sites it's obvious that these, let's say, core metrics are useful for all. So this is what we use, but when it comes into specific features of this data, no? imagine we are talking about visits, and then it's there's a domain that they want to know visits by some other properties that are more related to the domain. So visits are still in the core, no? because this is core for all the company. But then there are no new visits that are built in the domain. So this is in the domain. So they are doing these visits, but with these additional features that they need to consider for their domain. So this cross domain, it's not kind of real, no? It's kind of, there is a core domain, which is the core data, which is the basic and, and the volume is, is, is not the same as all the rest of the domains. I'm not, I'm not sure if I am I'm setting I, the question. Just to, maybe I, I can add something, which is uh, these uh, core domains, uh, which is about traffic, uh, users, uh, and okay. content, for example. Um, I don't know, for now it, it makes sense for one team to own these uh, domains in, in our situation, right? That this is what work what is working for us. If we we came into a into a situation where you know the team is cognitively overloaded uh, with this and we cannot able to we are not able to answer the the requests uh, that we get into the into this, maybe we need to split this uh, domain ownership into different teams, right? So yeah, I, I would say that we would use the same approach, but for now it's working for us to have uh, one team owning these uh, three, four domains that are uh, also heavily used by, by other uh, domains. Okay, yeah, I think that makes sense. I think it sounds like it's not necessarily that the core domains or the core data sets are like, very, very broad metrics. It's not that anything that's cross domain becomes that. It's that it's specifically the things that you would use in your data products as downstream data products and that it's just kind of, the, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, somebody had asked, uh, what platform are you using to kind of communicate? You know, you talked uh, uh, somewhat about the data discovery and, and things like that of, of how, you're, how are you talking about 
things within um, the teams and, and collaborating and communicating with each other. Yeah, we use a Slack also. Yeah. And, and then, but like from a, is most of the communication done in Slack and meetings and stuff, or is it mostly done kind of async in, in things like the data catalog? You mean I, it's, the, go go tell me please. I think no. It the communication is uh, is done through through Slack. Um, maybe it's important or, or uh, good to mention that we have shared channels between, for example, in in our case, not the, the the central team and each of the domains. We have one channel per combination, right? So a central team and domain A has a channel uh, together and, and the same for B and C, right? And also uh, maybe Sandra, you want to comment more on that, but we have a weekly or bi-weekly syncs with uh, all the different domains. Yeah, yeah. there are also these uh, bi-weekly syncs. We also know in Slack, we make announcements. We also have a newsletter where we are, where there's new data, which is uh, important for a domain or, or in core, no? We are doing this announcement. And then, you mean this communication is, is very reduced, uh, uh, communication around the data, because if you have the tool where you can ask your questions, then it is not, not necessary all this amount of uh, conversations, because you no, know, I know that if I'm looking for the location of this data, I know where I need to go. If I want to know what is this data about, I know where I, know, where, where I need to go. So it, this let's say threat is is very uh, reduced no and this is is something that we realize it eh? how the communication with the team was reduced by putting all this information it it, it was so we saw it we, we saw it how, when when it happened yeah and, and what well, uh, you know you, you've talked kind of you sprinkled throughout about what are signs that this is working and your return on investment and even just that of like the back and forth the interrupt requests and things like that like do you have metrics that you're able to track or share about or is it more is it kind of a lot more of that anecdotal of well you know this thing used to take six months and now it takes you know three weeks or um but it's not as much of a pure numbers thing and, and just like what you know we've talked a lot about lots of benefits but you know, is there anything where people could kind of put that up on their board to track against if they if they were to try and go down the same journey we don't have a specific metrics no that are measuring this but uh, we have the experience so i remember that it was maybe a quarter to develop a data set for a domain. Uh, and now I think I can say that uh, a domain team is able to build in a quarter a low level aggregation data set and the metrics and maybe also the dashboard so they can do the full, the, the full journey of the data from source or from raw data to, no, to, to visualizing data in a quarter or, or, or less. And then this is, it is there, no? We, we don't have this uh, measure because uh, we are not measuring it, but but we saw it. Yeah, that, that, that seems to be a common thing of, of, okay, we know that we've got the return, but if you were to try and put like a number around the returns, it's like, how do you measure that? we're just doing things so much more efficiently and everybody's happier and working together as a team and we're we're more insightful on what we're actually doing and how things are working like yeah like a couple of uh, additions here i think that um w the first time that uh, a domain team no because we come from decentralization so we let go our pipelines to the domain and the first time that the domain is uh, autonomous in creating a modification um, and maybe you, you are not aware of it and you don't um, uh, no, they are fully autonomous. They don't tell you anything or and you know, this is also uh, 
a nice moment where you realize that this is working and that uh, they are now autonomous and building their uh, data product in the domain and, and, and they will screw up, but uh, they will uh, recover and, and they will do things uh, uh, better, right? So that's one thing, of course, it's not measurable. It's more of a, of a feeling. I, I was looking at, uh, at some point, I was looking on the uh, weekly querying users. So that's one of the metrics that we track in, in our uh, data sets that if we could, we, we're going to split this into, for example, uh, um, the users and which team they do belong, right? So um, it's true that we, sometimes what we have seen is that when we release a new uh, data set on a specific domain or the domain does that, there are more people on that domain querying the data, right? So at the end, you can see this in the, in the, in, in the, in the data. It's not that we, ha we make a big deal of it, right? But, but you can see the trend. Yeah. It's just more people are trying to figure out more information and can actually get to it. That makes sense. Um, Veljeet had asked about, like, how are you actually doing your domain boundaries? Like, how are you doing your, your domain driven design as to like, what is a domain? Is it um, product or teams or like, how, how are you defining that? I think that uh, for, is what they say with the domain driven design, right? So you will never get it right. <laughs> um, so, so we are iterating and, and finding uh, the, the best way for, uh, for us to, to make it work, right? So it, it made a lot of sense because we have these uh, other capabilities centrally that focus on a specific product, uh, recommendations, chat, etc., to also have this type of uh, domain. So for us, it's uh, one team, one domain, uh, except for the analytic solution uh, central team that owns uh, now owns, owns more than one. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, maybe this changes in the future, we don't know, but we will adapt the, the, the design of the domains as we uh, go along. Right, which I mean is exactly what you said. It's exactly what domain-driven design says. It's, it's, is it good enough for now? Um, so uh, Sheetal had asked, um, how do you manage between standardization versus autonomy? Um, I think specifically in, in governance, but kind of as well in, in other aspects as, as you scaled. Yeah, not, not easy to start, but um, <laughs> on the way. No, it's, I would say it's kind of a mindset and empathy between all the people producing and consuming data. Um, so what we are doing is there is there is a, a let's say a committee no where all the domains are represented there's one person for all the domains so when there is new data that is going to be tracked added no to this schema that we have no we have a single schema where we can um, do different shapes of data with different features or attributes no so when we are adding new uh, attributes no in this schema they are all there so they 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 are let's say approving no that we are adding this uh, new new feature no so imagine that uh, there's a new feature for for a user for example no and then at this moment at the beginning they were they were not taking care, no, it's, uh, no, I'm, I, I need this feature and I need it and, and this is the field name I'm going to use and, and, and that's all because I need this data tomorrow, no? But then when they are seeing that if they pay attention to all these things, it is easier for them, no, after for the analyst to consume the data. Also, if the analyst needs data from another domain, it's also easier if they understand the fields no, from, from the beginning, no, just taking a look to the data set. So they start developing no, this mindset of, okay, I need to care about this because no, the, the, then this data needs to be used and maybe this is for one domain and then maybe in the future, I'm going to consume the same feature of this, no, this attribute we are adding for a user, maybe I will also consume it. So, it, as I said, no, it's kind of a empathy or, or, or this mindset, no, that you need to care about it. 
and it's something that is happening very organically. It's it's not uh, no no very um, there's not uh, uh, proced procedures no that are difficult to follow. It's something that is happening. No people is getting there, which is uh, for me it's it's, it's uh, awesome. So, so you're saying it's not as much hard lines around this is the way that we tell everyone they have to do it versus let's have the conversation around what's the long term of this and we move better together. Is, is, is that a good way of, of approaching it, of, of thinking about it's more of the carrot angle versus the stick of like, hey, there's, you know, there's benefits to you if you think about how this is going to work with other Teams. Yeah, but you don't need to say this to them, no, because they they are getting there. So they are no. As we go, they are realizing that this is good for them. So if okay. they take care, it's good for them, no. Okay. Um, so uh, Erica had asked the uh, question about the software engineers and data engineering. Um, from what you had said from a previous question, it's it's not that you you tried to kind of go down that path and it didn't uh, work that well. Is is that the right way of of thinking about it? You know, kind of, or maybe where are the gaps that you're looking to fill as they're as they're getting there? Is that that you're trying to pull them more towards being able to do data engineering, or are you trying to more extend the platform towards them where they're at? You know, versus you know, the data literacy of, do you, are you trying to give them more skills or are you trying to pull the, the functionality more towards them? How do you bridge that gap? I can answer if you want. Oh, okay. okay. No, we, well, I think that what, what we have tried, uh, it's true that we, we have tried and, and it's not always working. One of the things that uh, we always look when hiring or when doing this type of things is uh, if you want to uh, train a software engineer to be a data engineer, he or she needs to be motivated by that. And that's the first uh, thing. And the second one is um, they need to have some kind of analytical thinking or, or sense or, or a sense of when working with data because it's not the same to build a, a, a product that is not using data than building pipelines where you have to take into account data quality then there is also maybe some backfilling to be done every time that uh, there is a request and and these are this is a mentality of uh, or a state of mind for the data engineer that is very common not so much for the software engineer right so you probably if you want to succeed on on this transition make sure that the software engineers fulfill these two uh, checks because uh, otherwise it's going to be very difficult and and that's where what we learned makes sense yeah you can't you can't just uh overload people if they don't want to learn this stuff if they don't want to be involved in it you know i think that's kind of the empathy angle as well of this might be something that somebody doesn't want to necessarily do for their career so learning a huge new skill set can be <laughs> a lot. Um, and then we've got uh, one, one last question here of uh, how do you enable a, a domain that needs to build pipelines from scratch? Do you have like template code, meta-driven, metadata-driven pipelines? You know, I think this is kind of two, two questions almost in one of like, it, do you have a sample of a data product that or multiple blueprints or whatever that people can do so that they can go from nothing to having something that looks similar to other things and they can modify for themselves, but also like how do you um, help them to go from, you know, from a mentality standpoint of how am I going to create this and, and, you know, is it all pipelines or is it, you know, oh, I'm going to use, um, you know, ELT versus ETL and, you know, all, all, all that different things of how much is structured where you tell them this is how you should do it versus this is how others are doing it. And, you know, so you don't have to kind of invent the thing from your entirety, you know, from, from soup to nuts. Yeah. So yes, we have it, uh, but we didn't build it from the very beginning, right? So there is a, a journey there also uh, that is important to mention. 
let's let's uh, step back. Um, we come from having all the pipelines in a single repository, right? And we started uh, we split them into multiple repositories because of our uh, peace of mind, right? Because it was simpler to to develop and to maintain, uh, etc. And and this uh, even with the centralization, right? So it was single team, multiple repositories. Um, for each of the of the pipelines, so what happened over time is that we we found it uh, useful to build a template, right? Uh, not because of the domain teams, but because for ourselves, right? So because when we were the, doing, let's create a new data set that is a low level aggregation, we were all, always doing the same steps or copy pasting the same type of code, right? So. What we've built is a, a wizard that uh, you can input uh, several parameters, like is this a, a metric table? Is this a low level aggregation? Um, what are the fields? What is the schema, et cetera, et cetera. And it builds a repository with the uh, files that do not change, right? Or the, that are, uh, or, and then the files that are easy um, uh, parameterizable, and then the, the pieces with the code where, that you need to change. But it's important that we build this for ourselves in the very first uh, moment, right? In for uh, the first time. Uh, then, um, with time, we saw that okay. Now that we need to hand over these pipelines to this uh, domain team, um, they can use this template themselves also, right? So uh, it's it's not that we started by let's build a template and and let's try to make it perfect and then we build the pipelines, but. We built the pipelines. We realized that we were doing many things uh, the same. We we stopped and said, "Okay, let's use a, a template," and then we offer this to the domains. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, um, and uh, you know, one one thing that uh, I, I would ask if if you're comfortable with it at, at any point, uh, or if you can clean it up so that it's not you know in data that you can't share, but you know, you've talked about having these kind of sample notebooks. If there is anything that you can share from those or, or your templates or anything like that, um, not today or anything like that, but if, if you can, um, you know, you don't have to have it as open source and that you have to support it going forward or anything like that. But it's, it's exactly what you talked about of, of people are having to think of these things kind of in and of themselves, right? That where they have to invent everything in their own head. Um, so if you can show, I think what you, you've done a lot around data products and made it so that it's very consumable for people. So if you've got things that you can share where it's not even just a post, but it's, it's like, hey, we've got a couple of sample notebooks and we've just put in some dummy data. And, you know, yes, we would have you know, <laughs> 10 million users versus here, here we're going to do a sample notebook with, you know, uh, 5,000 generated uh, random names and, and some information. But that, that type of stuff as well could be um, really interesting for folks because I think you, you all have really nailed a lot around um, how to approach doing these, these data products to make it so that you can create new data sets easily and that people can actually use them and consume them. So um, you just, at any point, that would be my, my simple request to you at any point in the future, if you want to do that, I want to help facilitate that. Thank you. Yes, no, we have thought about this, but again, no, it's, it's uh, not our uh, main um, purpose at the moment to, to release this as, as a, open source on anything although we we well there are a couple of things no that it's always not your uh, first priority and then um even though we have done all this journey it's still a bit embarrassing to to share this uh, so we need to clean it up and um yeah. change some things before uh, this can be uh broadly uh shared maybe it happens next year let's see um, we have also pending some some more uh, writing on on the technicalities and and some people in the team uh, is started uh, has started working on a third uh, blog post on on the uh, more um, much more technical than than the previous ones right so, okay. so yeah we hope we can share in in some months uh, more things uh, but uh, as of today it's still a bit uh, embarrassing yeah. to 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 share. <laughs> 
literally Sorry. everyone that I've talked to has said that. So it's like, you know, I, I, I don't know how we can get over the embarrassment uh, angle or if we ever can, but um, yeah, I, at any point I, I want to do that, but um, I'm here to help on that. But uh, so I think, um, so I'm going to go ahead and drop those two links in again into the chat. Um, so these are two great posts. And for anybody that's catching the recording, um, I will have those links in the um, bottom. But uh, yes, they, uh, Javi and Sandra wrote some amazing posts. Um, and then as well, if either of you have it up, um, feel free to drop your jobs link into the um, into the chat as well in case anybody is interested. And, and if you can send me that, um, I'll put that in the YouTube uh, things as well. So people can can look for jobs. And so, you know, follow you on Twitter or uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, your your preferred one for people following you. Um, any of them or both. Like we want to be followed. <laughs> okay. Um, sounds good. Um, and if you could send me the a copy of the slides, just shoot, shoot them to me in an email. So that way I can link to them as well on the YouTube. But uh, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about before we sign off. But otherwise, thank you so much for your time. It's been amazing and very helpful. We'll have this uh, posted up on the YouTube relatively soon for folks. No, thanks a lot for the invite. We, I remember the uh, beginning of uh, Northern Hemisphere summer, we were already discussing about this, so in June, and it, it finally happened. So very glad to, to be here. Yeah. Well, you had, you had gone on uh, paternity leave, so congrats on that as well. It seems a very common thing in data mesh that I, I've talked <laughs> to uh, three or four presenters who are like, I just had a baby. I just had a baby. So I think it's, it's a thing. So, But uh, well, yeah, thank you all. We're saying thank you both for, for so much for this. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, and if you've got more questions, uh, you know, thank you find them on Twitter or in the Slack or, or things like that. So, all right, thanks everyone. Thanks right. for also for organizing. <laughs>